So you you announced th this morning that you are indeed running for Congress in CD8 to replace Gabby, and um, this decision seemed to take a, a while to you know, work through. What was your, your thought process, and why did this take a, a, a two or three weeks to play itself out? Well, there was a lot to think about, and, and uh, even though uh, I know you didn't intend it, um, there's no replacing Gabby. Uh, I don't intend to replace her because you know she made well fill the seat. Yeah, fill the seat. She made a tremendous impact on uh, our country after the shooting and before that on our district. Uh, but I'm really honored, first of all, that she asked me to consider this. And then my family and I had to figure out, could I do it physically? Could they do it in terms of support that I needed from them? It took a long time for us to work through that. We've made a list of pros and cons. And finally decided uh, just this week, really, that it was uh, something that I could do and that they would be behind me for. I wouldn't do it without their support. And so it took a while to consider it. You know, it's a big leap for me. I've never run for office, so I had to figure out one, do I want to do it? Uh, secondly, can I do it in terms of the fundraising and the campaign organization? And that's all coming together very quickly, I'm glad to say, and we're doing really well on, on all levels with that. And Jen Cox, who is going to be my campaign manager, sees and knows the district. She's, uh, she jumped on board this week, and with that, the decision was pretty easy to make in the end because I knew I had a good team behind me. In addition to supporting you, endorsing you, is Gabby going to give you some financial support? She's sitting on a pretty good war chest. Well, I, I think that's a little bit more complicated. Um, she can't any more than anyone could transfer money to me. Um, there's a limit on what any individual can give, and it's the same for everybody. So I don't really know what she can do beyond that. It's a little bit more sort of uh, in the weeds for me. I, I don't really know how the whole finance uh, rules, financing rules, uh, really take place. I'm going to leave that to our financial um, finance director to figure out how that may, may, would happen, if it can happen at all. But I hope that I'll get their uh, contributions directly, and they've certainly been helpful since this morning in uh, reaching out to their donors to support me. It's, it's a lot of effort to go through this uh, a primary, and it, it's looking at this point, like you won't have a, a primary opponent, and then a special general election to really um, be in office for a, a very short term. Congress is scheduled to be in session for maybe a month because this is a, an, an election year a after you would be certified in July if you were to win. You know, is it worth going through all of that effort if you might not run in the fall? Absolutely worth going through it because the people of Southern Arizona need a voice in Congress. And actually, the I've looked at the congressional calendar from June through the, um, well, January actually, when the new Congress is sworn in. And there's going to be at least uh, three and a half or four months in Washington based upon the current calendar. Uh, so there's going to be a lot of work to do there. And I would guess, uh, you know, coming back after the election, there'll be the usual lame duck um, session, which will produce other legislation. So there's a lot of work to do to make sure the voice of Southern Arizona is well represented in Congress. And also, of course, to continue our really outstanding constituent services operation that we have in the district. I don't want to see that fall off. Uh, in June uh, and be disrupted for six months because clearly if someone else were to win this uh, election, the special, they may not continue with our staff, particularly if it's uh, someone from a different party. And those staff have worked hard for the constituents of Southern Arizona. I want to make sure we can continue so that. So if you are to win, you'll keep the same staff no, together? No, I asked them uh, the other day when I told them I was resigning to run, and I want them all to remain on the team. Uh, here and in D.C. because I'm going to need them to keep the operation rolling as it has been. And uh, I've got a lot of nods around the table. You know, a question that we've been asking basically everybody, um, I, I understand that you're only talking about eight at this point, and, and it is a shorter session, and right now Congress couldn't pass a bill to save their lives. Um, but what, what's, your, what's your stand on, uh, what's your stand on, on drugs I mean, as a border issue? It's a huge issue, not only for our district, which is, uh, you know, we have about 50% of the drug seizures in the entire border uh, coming through uh, Congressional District 8. It's been an issue that the Congressman's uh, district has been focused on for four years at least. It was actually the and, last conversation we had before. Yeah, the, uh, and it's, uh, it's a terrible problem. It's not just a problem that relates to the safety of the people in, in the CD8, but it's also a problem nationally. Because if we're the major conduit for drugs into the country, those drugs go out of uh, the border, and they go to Tucson, they go to Phoenix, they go all across the country from their distribution. And so it's, a, it's really affecting the whole country. And that's one of the issues that I think really there's some bipartisan uh, uh, 
support for is to work hard to continue our efforts to uh, secure the border as best we can to prevent those cartels from bringing uh, uh, their drugs through and endangering the people who live along the border with their, their violence that they have brought into Mexico. So it's a real issue that I'm going to be doing a lot with. I've worked very closely with the ranchers representing the congressman with the Border Patrol, and I want to pick right up where we left off and say, what can we do to help? There is a bill uh, or a piece of legislation that was passed uh, this session on behalf of Congresswoman Gibbons, even though she couldn't introduce it, mm -hmm. to build uh, cell phone towers along the border to allow the people who live on the border, the ranchers, to communicate with each other as well as to call on law enforcement. Uh, we want to guide that to uh, completion. You know, someone's got to stay on top of that because it's in the Department of Homeland Security budget, but if it's not addressed and pushed, it may fall on, uh, by the wayside. And I'm going to be working hard to make sure that doesn't happen. So there's a lot of work we can do, even in a short period of time. Working for veterans, of course, is a major concern of mine. That's a bipartisan issue. There are places where we can do things together. The bigger issues that have been in gridlock, probably not so much, but certainly there are some that we can tackle, and I want to do that. So if you win, you'll be representing a district that I believe, and don't quote me on these numbers, and I promise I won't quote you on yours, but uh, it's something like 64% of Tucson voted to legalize marijuana for medicinal uses here, and Gallup polls recently, and it would, in over the last five years, have trended towards about between 45 and 65% of the American population in favor of either outright legalization or modification to decriminalize, either for medical use or you know, a, a more of a European model, uh, you know, is it, is it time to revisit the American drug control policy? Well, I think the American drug, the war on drugs has been studied over and over again since it started under President Nixon, and I think a lot of people are saying, is it the right policy, is it working? I really think that the answer is twofold. First of all, we've got to stop the flow coming in from Mexico, which brings with it violence, uh, illegal activity along the border and throughout the country. Uh, a lot of people are then, uh, you know, get involved with drug use. And let's, re let's remember that the cartels are not just bringing marijuana in, they're bringing in meth and heroin and cocaine, mm -hmm. drugs that are very serious and can really be debilitating. So the other side of the coin is what are we doing about prevention services and, and treatment services? Uh, that's lagged far behind the so-called war on drugs, which is a border uh, and, and illegal activity issue. We've got to do both. And I've been involved over the last five years with local efforts and prevention with behavioral health agencies. And I think we have to beef that up because people really need help to get out from under the, the, the crushing uh, effects of drug abuse. So it's really both. And I think when the voters in Arizona obviously have spoken about medicinal of marijuana, it's still underway in terms of the legal process. And I believe that when the voters speak, you, you pay attention and uh, hopefully follow their will. Speaking of will, uh, I don't want to I don't want to prejudge your winning here. But it, were you to win, you're you're in a very unique position. I mean, you come from a nationally known office at this point. Uh, you know, a tremendous amount of respect within the community simply based on what's happened. Uh, you know, you, you're kind of without ever having set foot in elected office, uh, the elder statesman. Uh, you know, how does that factor into your into your plans legislatively and uh, and, and politically? Well, it's a great to be called elder statesman. I'm not sure I've earned that title, but I certainly would. Uh, wouldn't uh, you know, put it aside. I, I think the important thing for me is that I've had a lot of life experiences. Uh, being 66, you go through a lot in your life. I've been fortunate to be married to the same woman for 44 years. We were childhood sweethearts, and you know I feel very blessed by that. And I've got great grandkids. So there's a lot of my life experience that I'm going to bring to the job. I think I really understand uh, the issues that seniors face, Medicare and Social Security, because I'm of that age. I also understand the issues of uh, my daughters and sons-in-law that generation, uh, particularly as it relates to jobs and opportunity. And then I think uh, really about my grandkids who are going through schools um, and who have seen the effects of budget cuts on education uh, and the class size and all the rest. So all of that plays into what I, who I am. And of course, my wife and myself, small business experiences, in a, it made a major impact on how I look and how do we support small businesses. I'm very fortunate that I've had many opportunities in my life, and I want to take those opportunities and experiences and put them to work for the people of Southern Arizona. And hopefully they'll see that uh, that can do that and they'll give me their vote. A, a lot of what you've been talking about today is uh, continuing Gabby's legacy and you know carrying on her work. You worked with her for a number of years. What are the areas where you would have a different stance on the issues than, than she has had? Where, what would you be doing differently if you were to take that seat? Well, you know, in terms of differences between myself and the congressman, there probably aren't 
much, uh, aren't many, uh, all of the policies and priorities that uh, she has uh, worked with, I've been right alongside with her, uh, providing advice when asked, and sometimes uh, helping shape those policies through uh, the work that we've done together. A good example of that is that when I was uh, uh, her outreach director during the 2006 campaign, my first assignment from her was to put together policy roundtables. We had 23 different groups that met with her on issues that relate to the constituents, the Southern, Southern Arizona residents. And from that, uh, she learned a lot, I learned a lot. And from that, she also developed her positions or priority issues. So I've been part of that process right alongside of her. There really isn't any policy uh, decision that she's made that I disagree with. And, uh, but there may be new things that come along uh, in, now that she's no longer in Congress that I'll have to tackle and I'll be ha willing to tackle them based upon my own experience and what I think is important. I really think that most people just want to get the job done. Solve problems, don't keep talking about it and bickering, just do something. In fact, I remember when the Congresswoman was watching the debate over the debt limit, she said, they just need to get it done. And that's one of the reasons that motivated her to go to Congress on August 1st and vote for that bill. Uh, and that's kind of how I approach it. You know, there's enough talk and enough vitriol, we just need to get it done. And I'll be finding, looking for ways in which we can do that together. And there may be places that she's not gone that I will need to go, and we'll find out when we get into this. Last, oh, at least last one for me. Uh, speaking of vitriol, uh, the Gallup poll ending January 25th said that, uh, indicated that American, uh, American job approval rating for Congress is at 13.2 percent, which is a couple points above the lowest it's ever seen. Um, you know, given your given your interest with the, and I always get the name of it wrong. I'm sorry. The, uh, the your university project, the. Uh, well, it's not the university. Civil disc civil discord. I'm sorry. The, my my program, what the program our family started, is called the Fund for Civility. Thank you. Respect and understanding. Uh, what from that do you take to Washington? I mean, what's how, how do you help well, turn things around on the hill? I think I take a lot of that because when I was in the ICU room, thinking about one the support we got from our community and the prayers and compassion that was supporting us in our healing process. It came to me that one of the things we could do is to try to promote civility and respect and understanding, which is the title of our fund. So we started an anti-bullying program in schools. We've started a mental health awareness program. We've been asking people, faith leaders, to talk about civility in public life. So I was taking all of those ideas, all of those values to Washington because that's who I am. Uh, I hope I'll make a difference. I, I really do think that some of the rhetoric is ratcheted down. I like that idea. I'd like to keep it uh, ratcheted down and do my do my part to make this a more civil and uh, respectful discourse as we go forward. So that's certainly a tone that I want to bring with my uh, hopefully with my election and my t my term in office. Anything else we need to know? Yeah, we're, we're good. <laughs> All right. All right, guys. Thank, Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Appreciate it. Yeah. Sure.